And uh, and so I taught literature and loved it, loved teaching. I have my undergraduates in in literature and and, uh, loved doing it. And so he he came up and he was talking. This was happened at Christmas time, and back then we had we had home rooms. Anybody remember home room? You know, we had home rooms. So we had a home room, and uh, our home room is where we did our Christmas party. And so we did our Christmas party, and I'd, I'd play all kinds of pranks on these, these ninth graders just a lot of fun. I'd have a caramel apple eaten contest, and it'd be caramel covered onions, you know. And, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a fun trick to play on, on boys. Now, the girls would get the, get the apples, they'd eat theirs first, they'd win, then it's the boys' time. They're going really, to break the record, you know, and they'd jump into it. And so we just had all kinds of fun, fun doing that. It was, you know, a Christmas party, we did all that. And, uh, and so I'd kind of, you know, Right around before Thanksgiving, start playing up. Okay, Christmas party's coming up. Christmas party's coming up. Christmas party's coming up. And uh, so this year, uh, I went into my room, and my desk was just covered with pe- uh, uh, presents. It was just covered with presents that the kids had done, and they were looking forward to it, you know. And, and I said all kinds of things that planned for them, and I thought, wow, this is really pretty cool. And then. Uh, the guy that's going to be preaching, his name is Neil, Neil Sandlin. He, uh, about, about, oh, ten minutes into what we were doing, he comes up to me and takes me over to the side. A ninth grade boy now. And he says, he says, Coach, he said, uh, do you mind if I take a couple of those presents and take it to this teacher over here? There's not very much on his desk. I mean, I, I'm almost start crying now. But I'm almost, I, I mean, you know, that's what you want. That's what you're doing. And now here he is in the Lord's work. You know, and so he came up and I said, uh, do you remember? He goes, yeah, I remember. He goes, I bet you've never told anybody, you know. He just kind of shrugged his shoulders, you know. And I said, so this is the guy that's going to be preaching our, our Revive week this week, or this year. And I'm looking forward to it. Neil Sandlin, great guy. All right, so here we are. Oh, I've got to get set up here real quickly. Um, so, um, can we trust the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? It's what we're talking about today. And so, we've got, got a lot of information, and that's the thing, is, is that it, information sometimes just becomes information if we're, if we're not careful. Does that, does that make sense? You know, and I don't want that to be that. I want it to be something that's real to you, because uh, the Bible really is, I really believe the Bible is, is the Word of God. I, one of the reasons I'm here at Legacy because we believe in the, the primacy or the primacy of Scripture. Uh, it's you know that's what we're what we're here for. So the idea of can we trust the Bible? I think it's important for us to know why can we trust the Bible and what what is actually going on. And so last week we discussed why are you or why are we Christians? Do you remember what the answer to that was? What what's a good answer to why am I a Christian? Because it's true. Because it's true. And so. And what is the main point of Christianity? You remember? What is the main point of Christianity? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, remember the main point of Christianity is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so that's where it's coming to, the main point. And we're looking at that main point, and that's what all of Scripture, when you look at Scripture, you start out in Genesis, you go all the way through, and you see this redemptive thread all the way through. God's, God's plan of salvation to redeem humanity. And so, the theme of, of the Bible, we see it. And so, can we trust what the Bible says? Can we, can, we, can we know? Is there any way we can know what the Bible is actually saying? And then also, we talked about what is apologetics. We showed you a biblical approach and how we can show that God's, God exists. And I gave you, I talked about one argument. I gave you, talked, well, showed you a couple of arguments, but I talked about the cosmological argument. And then, what we'll do today, can we trust the Bible? Is the New Testament real history? which I think that's important for us to see because we focus on the New Testament, especially on the Gospels, and we see what the Gospels tell us because in there we see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, What do non-Christian sources say? How can we know and how can we show that the Bible is reliable? Uh, What we will do next week, we're going to talk about who is Jesus, who did he claim to be, what are the alternatives, how was he known in his day, what did they call him, who was he, you know, what, what was going on there. Did he really exist? Hard, hard to believe we've got to really address that. Uh, did Jesus really rise from the dead the week four? What are the facts of the resurrection? And I think this is really cool because we can really get into facts that we can, we can take away and say, 
These are historical facts. Now, now what you do with the facts is, is going to be up to you, you know, the way you do it. But I think you'll, you'll be able to see what the facts are. What is the gospel, and how can we share the gospel? And so, uh, if you remember, we talked about what is apologetics. And remember I said giving reasons for your beliefs or why I believe what I believe. Then I talked about faith, and I'm, and I'm getting ready to jump in what we're doing today. But remember, this is so important, because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the reality of things hoped for. And he says, and this version says, the proof of what is not seen. The old King James says, faith is the substance. So it's got a lot of substance to it. Which substance is stuff. I mean, it's got, it's got information. It's got things we can, we can put our hands on, things we can see, and he said, or, or things we can know. And he says, the proof, the substance of things hoped for, but it's the proof of what is not seen. See, I wasn't there when Jesus rose from the dead. I wasn't there when Jesus rose from the dead. The only way I can believe it is by faith, but, but it's not a blind faith. It's something that, as Craig Hazen says, it's something, a, a historical event, that can be investigated with our eyes wide open. We can investigate the facts. And so, look at that. Well, I'm going to start off with a, with a quote from the Da Vinci Code, and I almost didn't do this because the Da Vinci Code's old news, and I know that. But it, but it basically, it was a catalyst to a lot of things that's going on now. And, uh, and I've got a book, I've actually got the book, uh, one of the books, and it was, it was an easy read. It was rather disappointing, not just because of what they're trying to show. I just I didn't uh, like sort of, but it says right here, more than 40 million copies sold. Do you see that? More than 40 million copies sold. And, and that's getting out. And it's, and it's, it's really denying uh, some of the things that, that we believe. And I want you to see, this is Robert Langdon. He's a fictional Harvard professor from a fictional uh, division of the school, the, the division of, of ancient symbology, s symbols. N nothing existed, or it didn't at the time, may now, but it didn't at the time when the, when the book was written. Listen to what he says, and remember what our definition of faith is. Okay, so we just did the definition of faith, but listen what he says. This is, this is his character. In the movie, this was played by Tom Hanks. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie or anything else, but this was, his character was played by Tom, Faith, Tom Hanks. He says, every faith in the world is based on fabrication, <laughs> a lie. You, you see what he's saying? He says, every faith. He says, that is the definition of faith. Acceptance of that which we imagine to be true. That which we cannot prove. J just the opposite of what Hebrews tells us. D do you see, see this? And he says, every religion describes God through metaphor, allegory, and exaggeration. Now he's talking, this is close to the end of the book, and he's talking to uh, the girl whose name is in the, in the book is so Sophie Nouveau which Sophie is wisdom, nouveau is new. So it's a new wisdom, trying to find a new wisdom. How are we going to... Okay, she's supposed to be a descendant of Jesus in, in the book. So every religion describes God through metaphor, allegory, and exaggeration. And he goes on and he says this, the problems arise when we begin to believe literally our own met metaphors. When we begin to take the Bible, we begin to take anything literally. He says, those who truly understand their faiths, and notice this, understand the stories are metaphorical. Religious allegories become a part of the fabric of reality, and living in that reality helps millions of people cope and be better. You see what he's saying? He's saying all religion, all the Bible, anything that's doing with religion, all it's really good for is to just make me feel better. Because it's, it's just a bunch of metaphors, but, it, but if it makes me feel better, that's okay. All right? You, you see that. And so the focus is all on me now. The focus is all on me. Now, we need to be able to show that we can trust. So let's use the following acronym. Let's use the following acronym to help us uh, remember. And this is what I've, I use. And, and I've, I'm an acronym guy. I like to, I, it helps me to remember. And so I use this acronym, uh, NAMES, N-A-M-E-S. There's a reason I use NAMES now. I used to use another one before. The reason I use names is because I'm going to get to a point at the end today where names become very important for us. Names in the Bible. I think it's, it's really, really pretty neat to see. And so we look at the names. And so the N stands for non-biblical sources. And I look at non-Christian sources and, and, 
Christian sources as well that are non-biblical, but the idea is non-biblical sources. And I, and I think you're going to be amazed when you see that the non-biblical sources, the non-Christian sources, are going to tell us something about history that pretty much tells us, tells us some of the same story that the Bible tells me. And then we're going to look at archaeological discoveries. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, although we could spend months on that. I mean, it's, uh, and I, I like what uh, Mr. Littlejohn told me yesterday as he was walking out. We were talking a little bit about archaeology. He, says, he said uh, he had a professor in seminary that said, every time a skeptic opens his mouth, an archaeologist comes along and sticks a shovel in it, you know, because they, they find things. I thought that was a good quote. Uh, then we look at manuscript evidence, and this is really fascinating to me. And, uh, and the, the world's, probably the world's leading expert in manuscript evidence is, just lives less than a mile away from me, just, just right over here. He's been on campus here a couple of times, and, uh, and I'll talk about him a little later. Then we look at eyewitness testimony, the E stands for eyewitness testimony. And then the S stands for statistics of names. Statistics of names. Names in the Bible and how they're used. And, and so uh, let's look a little bit of this. And so let's, uh, let's get into this uh, now. All right? So we look at the non-Christian sources. And I've got these printed out, some of these printed out for you, so you don't have to write a lot of stuff down. So if we look at the non-Christian sources... I want you to see this. This is really pretty cool. When you um, examine some of these guys, like Tacitus was a historian uh, right around the year 56, AD 56. You know, Jesus, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but that's just after Jesus. This is during the time period of eyewitnesses, by the way. The time period of eyewitnesses. And so we'll, we'll look a little bit at what he says. Then we see Josephus. Josephus, uh, uh, a Roman Jewish historian, uh, he uh, became a Roman historian after the, after the siege of Jerusalem. Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. And he begins writing, and he's just in, incredible. We got his antiquities that we have access to. And it's pretty interesting because Josephus actually tells me when James, the brother of Jesus, died. He actually talks about it, tells how it happened. They took him outside the city. They stoned him. James was the... Uh, uh, the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And what, this is what's really neat about James. James, the brother of Jesus, was not a believer. I mean, the, the, the Bible actually tells us that, before, that, that James and some of his other brothers go to Jesus and say, come home, you're embarrassing us. But post-resurrection, Jesus, Jesus appears to James, and James has this incredible transformation. And he becomes a martyr. And that happens in the year 62. And that becomes a very important date for us. Okay? And then uh, we'll look at plenty of the younger. And there, there are tons of others we could look at. Tons of others we could look at. Now, if you'll turn to the very last page in your notes, I, I want to read uh, something that's it's, it's part of what Tacitus says. And then plenty of the younger. And I want you to get this, because I think a lot of times people don't understand exactly how much is out there. And there, uh, it, it's, it always amazes me that a lot of times skeptics will try to come along and try to discredit any source. You know, let's just discredit the source. But, but that, that takes a little bit of work if you're going to try to do that. And, and uh, so this is, uh, this is Peter Williams, uh, which I'll talk about him a little bit later, but this is his translation. Now, he's, he's, he's writing about what happened in Rome in AD 64, AD 64-65. That's when Nero burns Rome. Okay, Nero burns his own city. Okay, and then he blames the Christians. Okay, now there's a reason he blames Christians, because Christians had, been, people have been uh, talking about the Christians, because you remember when, uh, when Paul goes into Thessalonica, and he go, then he goes into Berea, and he's, he's starting churches and he's doing this. They, they starting churches and he's spreading the gospel and uh, preaching. And during that time, he gets run out of the city. And one of the things they accuse him of, these are the men who are turning the world upside down. Because what happens, cities change when, when, when Christianity came. And, and uh, it all goes up to Rome. Why aren't the taxes being paid as much? Why aren't not? Well, the, the temple prostitutes are being shut down. Uh, the, the idols are not being sold as much. 
There are all kinds of things that are happening. And you're going to read a little bit about it right here. Okay? So let, stay with me. And I, and I know reading, is, reading to you is not fun, but, but this is important. But neither help by humans, nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle the scandal, and the scandal is Nero burns Rome, or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumor. So, Nero's calling it a rumor, and he's trying to, he's trying to blame someone else. To scotch the rumor, Nero substituted his culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, founder of that name, uh, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. So that sounds almost biblical, doesn't it? I mean, do you, do you see it? See what's coming out? And he says, and the pernicious superstition, the pernicious superstition is Christianity. The pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, you know, the persecution, the death of Jesus, all the things that have happened that was going on right there in Acts chapter 2 and, and at the end of the gospel. It was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease. That's what he calls it. But in the capital, Rome itself. So Christianity spread fast, spreads into Rome very quickly. And so he's, he's telling us this. It says, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find vote. First then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the account of arson, because they didn't said, said it, but for the hatred of the human race. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. Um, persecution's not fun. Standing for Christ, not fun. You know, and, and, and I defend Christianity, and the Christianity I defend is not something that makes me feel better. Okay, like, like, like the Da Vinci Code is trying to get. It's not something that makes me feel better. It's something that's real. Okay? And, and notice this. I had a professor, J.P. Moreland, and uh, we were going over some church history, and he would, he would get up and say, shame on you if you do not know your church history. What the persecutions and the things people have done so we can have the Bible, so we can, so we can worship. He said, shame on you if you don't know that. And uh, uh, very powerful. And it says, uh, uh, they were covered while being skinned and torn to death. Or they were fastened on crosses and when daylight failed were burned to serve as lamps by night. Hence, in spite of guilt which had earned the most exemplary punishment, there arose a sentiment of pity due to the impression that they were being sacrificed is not for the welfare of the state, but to the ferocity of a single man. He wrote. Look at what Pliny the Younger says. He says, he's writing to the Emperor Trajan about Christians, about what's happened. And he's writing to him saying, have I done this right? I want to make sure. Here he is, he's, he's, uh, he's a governor. He says, I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, I interrogated them a second, third time threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be let off to execution. As for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked the gods, plural, in words given by me and prayed with incense and wine offering to your statue, he says, uh, which I'd ordered to be brought for this very purpose along with the images of God, and also curse Christ, and here's what he says, interesting, which it, is, which it is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do. He said, I thought they should be discharged. So if they, if they deny Christ and they go through this and they pray to the gods and they pray to the emperor and they say, this is it, he says, I, I, I let them go. Did I do the right thing? He's asking the question. He said, I let them go. Others named the document said they were Christians but later denied it saying they had been. But they had ceased, now get the, get, get the number of years, three years ago, or many years ago, or even as much as 20. Now that's pushing Christianity back, that it's already spread, for, it's been going on for a while. So it's pushing it back at least 20 years, maybe even more, that we see. Because a lot of times people say, you know, Christianity is a made up thing in 325, the Council of Nicaea, and it's just not true. Here's, here's what we're seeing. And he says, um, uh, or even as much as 20. 
They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error. They had been accustomed, here's, listen to this, this is a church service. They had been accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn to sing antiphonally a song to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by an oath not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. Sound like a bunch of bad guys, doesn't it? What they're promising. Think about it. He's even mentioning this is what they do. They're good, good people. They're honest. You know? And he says, Many people of every age, every rank, and of both sexes are being and will be called to trial. Nor is it only cities that are affected, but the disease, Christianity, the disease of this superstition is also reaching villages and farmsteads. It seems possible to check and correct this. It is pretty well agreed that the temples, which had almost become deserted, have now begun to be frequented again. And all the sacred rites, which had been neglected for a long time, are recommencing, and that the flesh for sacrificial rites is being sold, for which up till now, it was hard to find a purchaser. I mean, Christianity's had, had a big influence. Now notice, notice this. And so... You get these three, and there are many others. There are others, such as Thallus, who talks about uh, the darkness covering the face of the earth when Jesus dies on the, on the cross. Uh, some people think that he's actually reporting a miracle, but he tries to cover it up and say that it was, it was an eclipse of the sun, which eclipses don't last for three hours. You know, but, it, but it's the way he's trying to cover it up. Uh, he was a Mediterranean. Um, and there are many more, but I want you to get this, and I've got this printed out for you. But just look at what the non-Christian, non-biblical testimony tells us. The basic storyline confirmed by non-Christian sources. Jesus lived during the the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We just read about that. He lived a virtuous life. He was a wonder worker. Uh, He's actually, in in the chart sheet in the Talmud, Jesus is actually uh, accused of sorcery. Now, sorcery in Jesus' day would have been doing miracles... What, what would appear to be real miracles, but doing them in the power of who? Satan, yeah, doing them in the power of Satan. And so he's actually charged with sorcery. He's not, not doing magic tricks. That's okay. I mean, people did sleight of hand all the time. But, but accused of sorcery. And so he's, the, the idea of the miracles are actually kind of an enemy attestation that he really was doing, doing miracles. So you don't, you, they're, they're not going to put you in jail for, not doing, for doing fake stuff, Okay. He's a wonder worker. He had a brother named James. By the way, the Bible actually says, when remember Jesus is doing miracles and the Pharisees say and uh, accuse him of doing, doing the, his work in the power of Satan. And Jesus says, then he pronounces the woes onto them. You know, you've gone too far. You'll, you'll never come to the truth because of this. So he had a brother named James. Okay, he has a brother named James. Okay? Uh, we just talked about that. Josephus tells us that. He, he, was, he was acclaimed to be the Messiah. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. An eclipse and earthquake occurred when he died. He was crucified on the eve of Passover. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for their belief. Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome. And his disciples denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God. Now, this sounds a lot like what the New Testament tells me. Okay? Now, uh, a a former professor, I almost said old professor, but I get in trouble when I say that. A former professor of mine, Dr. Gary Habermas, he kind of says it this way. He said, look, if the Bible's the word of God, he said, I think I can show beyond beyond any doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible's the word of God. The Bible's not the word of God. It's just a good history book. Then that good history book tells me Jesus rose from the dead. He said, but if all I have is ancient histories, and I have things, and I can look at what even people agree on what the facts are. He said, I can come to the point that Jesus rose from the dead. And because history is speaking loud to it. I mean, isn't it neat we're in Christmas time right now? I mean, the whole thing, the idea of hope, and for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I mean, you think about what's going on. All right? So these are, these are important to get. And, and again, I'm giving you a lot of information, I know. But this is, this is to show us that there is a lot of information, and I'm just barely touching the surface of a lot of it. So these are, are non-biblical, but they're Christian sources. So we have Clement of Rome uh, in AD 95. He's appointed by Peter 
and called a disciple of the disciples. Now, why is this important for us to see these guys? Um, J. Warner Wallace, who is a, uh, uh, a reasonably new apologist, he's, he's a fairly new Christian, didn't become a Christian until he was like 35 years old. He was a, a detective, and he became a cold case detective. Now, it's a really pretty interesting story about his life. So what he decided to do, he wasn't a believer in Christianity, but he, tried, he said, I'm going to treat the story of Jesus and the death of Jesus like a cold case. And so he started investigating. And, and, and he comes to the conclusion that it's real. It really did happen. Jesus really did rise from the dead. And one of the things he mentions in his cold case is that in, in evidence, you have to have a chain of custody of the evidence. And we have in the church fathers, the early church fathers, the patristic evidence that we have. We've got these guys. Notice this. He's appointed by Peter. And called, he's called a disciple of the disciples. And he mentions the New Testament many, many times in his writings. Okay? And as do all of these guys. And we can, we can reconstruct a good portion of the New Testament just from, just from the guy's writings. And there, there are several. I'm going to give you three or four of them. Ignatius is called a hearer of the Apostle John. A hearer of the Apostle John. In other words, he heard John speak. He knows who John is. The Apostle John. Um, and then Polycarp is a disciple of John, the Bishop of Smyrna, and it's said that um, uh, as, as he's teaching, and he, he begins to teach other people, and one of the persons he teaches is a guy named Irenaeus. And I have Irenaeus' name out there uh, on yours right now. But we have others like Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Justin Mar, Origen, and the list goes on. But in this, if, we're, if you're looking at this, the, the chain of custody of what the New Testament says. It's not being corrupted. Because very early on, very early on, I mean, if you look at with, with who these guys, a disciple of John, a hearer of the Apostle John, uh, appointed by Peter, you look at what these guys are, are doing, and then they're writing, the, they're, they're quoting Scripture, as Scripture, very early. Not that it becomes Scripture, and a lot of times people will say, the skeptics will say, well, the Bible became the Bible in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. It's not true. We go way, way back before then. And we see the Bible. The Bible already established. And in these three, I think it's these three, 25 of the 27 books of the New Testament are quoted from. Um, so it brings me to the archaeological evidence, okay? Isn't it archaeological? I want you to look at the screen. I want you to see this is really pretty neat. This is really pretty cool. You can barely make out something. Can, can you make it out? This is actually graffiti that dates to uh, probably the second century, maybe, maybe early third century, uh, kind of hazy about when it is, and maybe even, even you know, early second century. Uh, so can, can you see this? Can you see what's here? Kind of looks like a horse's head. You see it? Can you see the cross? And you got a guy here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it to where it's easier to see. So if we fill it in, it kind of looks like this. So you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so here you are, the real thing. Here it is. This is called the Alexamenos graffiti. Okay, because evidently this guy is Alexamenos. And what this says, now, never in history to be called a donkey has ever been good. Does everybody understand? I mean, we, we, people get called that all the time. And it's never, ever, in anywhere, it's ever been good. It's nothing good is associated with it, being called that. So here's what you have. You have somebody who's, wrote, who's done this graffiti, and he's making fun of someone named Alexamenos. And what it says, very hard, but in Greek, it says, Alexamenos worships his God. Do, do you see? Now, this is important because this, this is considered the earliest depiction of, of uh, what is believed to be Jesus on a cross. Okay, very early, very early depiction. It was not until about the 6th century that the idea of the cross became a, 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 an artistic thing. You know, now we wear crosses, we see crosses, I have crosses hanging in, you know. But, but in the early days, the cross, because it was a... It was a it was a method of killing people. It was a method of execution. You know, my brother used to say it like this. It, 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 was, it was like uh, if you were in the French Revolution and you were wearing a guillotine around your neck. 
you know, as a, as a decoration. And, and so, looking at this, you see that the cross is, is and like, like Paul says, look, the whole idea of the cross, the death, uh, death of Jesus, it's an, it's, it's, people look at it as, uh, as an affront. People look at it and says, it, say it's offensive. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Why? Because Jesus dies, and He dies for our sins. And, uh, but He rises again. So notice this, Alexamenos worships his God. It's a, it's a testimony that, that the people, at this time, they look at Alexamenos and say, he's worshiping somebody that got killed on a cross. How stupid is that? I mean, think about it. Why would you worship anybody that goes gets himself killed? Now think about it. 30,000 men during this time period get themselves crucified. And here we are talking about one of them. There's got to be something to it. There's got to be something to it that we're, we're singling out this one who gets himself killed on, by a Roman cross under Pontius Pilate on the eve of Passover. All right? So Pontius Pilate, I want you to see some of this. Pontius Pilate, for a long time, they said, look, there's, no, there's nothing that's been verified uh, by, uh, by history or archaeology that Pontius Pilate ever really existed. Again, skeptics say that. But in 1961, uh, this was found. It's an inscription. And here it is in Latin. But it says this. Uh, the prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, erected the Tiberium, a temple in, in Tiberius' name, to the august gods. I mean, it's, he's, we know he really existed. And, and, and he's talked about, I mean, we just read somebody talking about him under procurator Pontius Pilate. Okay? Discovered 1961. Here's another one. It's really pretty cool. This is the ossuary of Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the one in Mark uh, chapter 16 where when he, uh, he tells Jesus, he looks at Jesus and he said, uh, all right, well, let's come to it. Now remember they've been bringing in all these witnesses and none of the witnesses would agree. So finally Caiaphas looks at him and he had, Jesus had had all these trials. He had really had six trials. Three with the high priest. Remember, Caiaphas is the son-in-law of Annas, who had been the high priest the year before. And uh, so he had gone to Annas, he had gone to Caiaphas twice, he had gone to Pilate three times, and he goes back and forth. All these are at night, you know, uh, illegal, illegal trials. And uh, Caiaphas finally looks at Jesus and said, are you claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Because he won't say God. So are you the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies, I am. And what does, what does Caiaphas do? He tears his priestly robes. He tears his garment. He said, you've heard the blasphemy. We do not need any more witnesses. Okay? So this is Caiaphas. Uh, not only do we have archaeological proof of him, we actually have his bones. I mean, this is a bone box or a coffin. So you have the Caiaphas bone box. It's pretty, pretty neat. Now, if you think about archaeology, archaeology we actually have an archaeology study Bible that you can get. And, and almost every Bible now that's a study Bible, like the apologetic study Bible that we have, that we use here, the apologetic study Bible for students, on, on just about every other page or so, there's, they call it bones and dirt, where you see something archaeologically, some archaeological discovery, and it's, being, it's corroborating the story. One of my, fa my favorite two stories that are corroborated in Scripture the archaeological discovery, are from John chapter 5 and John chapter 9. John chapter 5, Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda. He's walking around and he sees, he sees this man who's crippled. Been, been crippled for a long time. He's been sitting there and you know the story. He says, he, Jesus says, why are you, uh, wh what are you doing? Why don't you get up? He says, I can. He says, nobody, nobody is here to put me in the pool because they thought there, there, was, there was rumors going around that if, you, if the water stirred, that it's an angel stirring the water, and if you're the first to get put in, you're going to be healed. Okay? And so it was the, the pool of Bethesda was the name of the pool. And so John, in John chapter 5, he tells, he says, it was by the sheep gate. Then he, then he gives this elaborate description. It's the pool with the five colonnades. It's a big pool. Now, colonnades are these lined hallways, big pillars with a roof on them. And it's shaped like a square going around this pool. Then right down the middle is another colonnade going. So you have five colonnades. 
And for a long time, skeptics said, look, there's no such place. I mean, that would be an easy place to find. In the late 1800s, the Pool of Bethesda was discovered, and the remnants of five colonnades were there. And it's at this time when, when Jesus just tells the, the crippled man, get up and walk. Now, here's a cool thing. The waters did stir. It was fed by an underground spring. I mean, it, the, the Bible's giving me details there that, that, are, that are pretty incredible. Then in John chapter 9, you remember the story in John chapter 9? Jesus sees a blind man. So here's a blind man. He sees him. And he says, uh, his disciples said, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You, you remember the story? What does Jesus say? No one sinned. This was done. This, this is happening so it can bring God to glory. For this moment, so he can be healed. You remember what Jesus, is really strange. It's really strange. Jesus uh, picks up some sand, spits on it, remember? Makes mud, puts it in his eyes. Puts it in his eyes. Anybody ever had sand in the eyes? You know what it feels like? What do you want to do when you get sand in the eyes? Wash it out. What does Jesus tell him to do? Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he goes and washes in the pool of Siloam. He can see. Can you imagine the scene? Him washing his face, and as he's washing his face, he starts seeing for the first time. Now, what did the Pharisees do? The Pharisees do begin to say, what did he do? What did Jesus do? It was a Sabbath? What, what's, what's wrong? And start doing it. Jesus broke all these laws. And the blind man says, I can see. I mean, don't you get it? And through the whole story, the blind man goes from physical sight to where he gets it. He knows who's right. He still hasn't seen Jesus. He didn't see him when Jesus put that in his eyes. He didn't see it. He, he'd heard who he was. And so Jesus sees him in the temple courtyard. Do you remember? And he comes to him and he says, uh, you know, I'm the one that healed you. And he goes, he, he goes uh, you know, it, it's, it's this wonderful, blessed reunion. He, the first time he sees Jesus, and Jesus says, now you can see. And then the, the Pharisees want to interview him again. The Pharisees uh, say, when did he do this? What did he, he goes, look, all I know is this. I once was blind, now I see. That's a good thing. And this guy has to be of God if he can do that. This guy has to be of God if he can do that. And the Pool of Siloam was excavated quite by accident in 2004 when there was a, a sewage problem in the city. And the Pool of Siloam now has been excavated. We know it, know it to be there. All right, so... Uh, you got Caiaphas, and here's, here's the inscription on his, on his bone box. The most, the most important archaeological discovery, maybe of all time, but definitely for the Bible and of the 20th century, was the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, date to the 2nd century, to the 2nd century, and they, they authenticate for us the transmission process of how the Bible is copied. Now, up until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the, the oldest Old Testament text we had was the Masoretic text, which dated to about 900 A.D. That was the text that was used for the King James Version of the Bible and the text that had been used all these years. And people, skeptics would say, look, look, this, we, the text we have are only go, date to 900 A.D. And, and skeptics would say, look, the, the Bible's been... The Bible's been miscopied. The Bible's been, um, it's been evolved over time and people have changed it and, it, and, and it's such a wonderfully uh, uh, written Bible that, that the, this book, it's got this unity all the way through the Bible, has to be changed and changed and changed over the centuries and edited and edited and edited and edited. Then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, 1947 by two little shepherd boys, two little shepherd boys uh, playing and they throw in rocks and into a cave and they hear glass break. They go in and see these earthen jars been broken with these scrolls and they just made the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. They take it into antiquities dealers. They, people come out, uh, archaeologists come to the caves, the Dead Sea Scroll uh, in Qumran, just outside of Israel, and uh, they go to Qumran and they find 11 caves that's just full of, it's like a library. All but one Old Testament book was found, and that was the book of Esther. All the others were found. The Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll, was completely intact. 
matched almost exactly to the Masoretic text of the, from the 900s. Now you think about this, you think about the process of copying, the co process of copying. Did the scribes do a good job? Yes, the scribes did a good job. And uh, I think it was 2011, I think it was 2011, Dr. Dan Wallace was having a debate in, uh, with, with Bart Ehrman, who's a, a skeptic. And they're both, they're both scholars, Bible scholars. And they were having a debate whether or not the Bible has been transmitted to us correctly. What, do, do what we have, the New Testament, is it really, can I really trust it? And uh, so the debate goes on, the debate goes on, and I'm there because of one of my students, his, at the time, his dad uh, was on the board with, with Dr. Wallace's ministry, and he said, he said, you need to go to this debate. Come to the debate. So we're sitting up front. So I've got this former student then. He's sitting over here, and I'm sitting here. Dad's sitting in between us, and we're at the debate, and it's just incredible. And so then it comes to question-answer time. And so Dr. Ehrman's uh, saying, you know, we, you know, the transmission process has been corrupted, and the New Testament's been corrupted. Uh, scribes weren't any good. And he said that a couple of times. So this former student jumps up to go ask a question. They have a line that's a question. He goes, he goes, I got a question. He jumps up. And at that moment, I'm thinking, what is he going to ask? <laughs> you know, well, my teacher sitting right there said this. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, I, and so I looked at his dad, and we both did this. We just kind of sunk down in our seat. <laughs> What's he going to do? And we just kind of shrugged our shoulders. He's bold, and, he, and now he's a bold witness for Christ. And it's, it's really neat. He's traveled all over Europe doing things. And, but but he, uh, he gets to the microphone, and he said, he said, you know, the great Isaiah scroll, you know, which, which dates, you know, 100, 150 years before the time of Christ, you know, to the second century B.C., he gets up and he says, didn't, didn't it show us that the scribes did a good job in the transmission process? What a great question. Not set up my student right there. It's my student. You know, and uh, he gets the thing, and I, I, it just, it was, it was really cursed. And uh, the answer was kind of, kind of fumbled with, and he said, "Well, I think I think it was corrupted before then." Oh, okay. Well, that's if you if you're going to think everything's corrupted, everything's corrupted. But we see the transmission process coming, and so what? A, what a great question. And I like this. I like this. This. If you get this idea, and I, I think I put this in yours, didn't I? Put this quote. In extraordinary ways, modern archaeology has affirmed the historical core of the Old and New Testament corroborating key points of the stories of Israel's patriarchs, the Exodus, the Davidic monarchy, there's your Old Testament, and the life and times of Jesus. And uh, from an article, Is the Bible True? Think about this. Think about what's saying. And this guy used to be, uh, uh, oh, this is, uh, this is from the, the U.S. News and World Report. Okay? All right? So we come to the manuscript evidence. Come to the manuscript evidence. And here's, here's one little manuscript I want you to see. This one right here. This is called P52. P just means papyrus. It's, it's a papyrus. We get the word paper. So it's, it's a paper manuscript. This dates very early. And it's part of the book of John. It dates, uh, it dates to about 115 A.D. Now, if John wrote the book of John, he, he's probably the last of the, of the gospel writers. This is, this is very early to the time when John wrote. I, I think John wrote in the... Tw uh, in the first century, but this dates almost to the first century, and some of the scholars say it dates about 115, but it could be earlier. Okay, and so uh, this little this little uh, manuscript is is really important. It's real small; it's about the size of the palm of your hand, and it has on one side John chapter 18 verses 31 and 33, and on the other side uh, 37 and 38. So it's on two sides. It's printed on two sides, which tells us that it was from something that's called a codex, which is a book. So if I take a book, like here I have the Bible, and I take a book, and I look at a page here, and I turn the page, I've got writing on the back. Does, does that make sense? And so some of these don't, don't have, but when, you, when, they, when they see a papyrus with writing on the back, there's good indication that it was from a bound book. Okay, because they bound books very early. So this is a very important one found in the 1930s from, a, from an excavation that was done in the 1890s. They found so much stuff in the 1890s, two guys named Greenfield and Hunt from Oxford 
went over to Egypt, a place called Oxyrhynchus, and they excavated just tons and tons of stuff, took it back to Oxford, and put it up, and people, scholars start going through things. Well, it was 1930, a, little, a young scholar was looking through, and he finds this little thing. It looks like a jigsaw piece of paper. I mean, it looks like a jigsaw puzzle piece. And he takes it and starts looking it's for, for research and what, what are called papyrologists, guys that know how to date the papyrus, partway because of the writing. It's like if we had a, a Declaration of Independence, we had an original Declaration of Independence, the letters would be completely different than the way we shape them now. Everybody seen one? A copy of the, you know, the S's look different and all the, all the different things. Well, we could, they can date these because of the writing, because writing changes. So if we look at the number of manuscripts, if you look at the New Testament, over 5,800 that have been cataloged. And, and uh, what's going on now, because uh, manuscripts for a long time were just, everybody knew what they were, and they're all on microfilm. And people would try to look at the microfilm and look at it. And microfilm's hard to look at. You can't see things. You can't really touch it. And uh, Dr. Dan Wallace in his ministry, uh, uh, he's, he's a, a scholar, a manuscript scholar. But what he started was to go and take high-definition photographs of these, of these manuscripts because they're deteriorating. Now, some of these, think how old these things are. They're very, very old. And so we have over 5,800, but in his, in his search... He see, he's, he's gone to look for some of them that have been cataloged, and he, some of them he can't find, or, or they've deteriorated already. And he's trying to preserve these manuscripts for us for the next generation. And by the way, you can go to csntm.org, and uh, you can see manuscripts in high definition. It's really, really quite exciting. So we have, we have over 5,800. Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's over 1,900. And all this search for manuscripts that has started recently, because for a long time, you think if you were a scholar, and there are 5,600 at the time, over, over 5,000, let's say, manuscripts, and you find a manuscript and you document it, and if it's, a, if it's not real, real old, if it's not outdating something, if it's not earlier than something else, well, that's number 5,604 or whatever. You know? and so, so it's not something that would motivate you. Now, there's a lot of motivation now. And in all this motivation and finding, and here's the number one motivation with it, people began buying up manuscripts. So what happened to manuscripts? Their price goes out of the roof. Uh, the Hobby Lobby uh, people, Steve Green family, they're, 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 uh, did the, the Museum of the Bible. Y'all familiar with the Museum of the Bible? They began uh, uh, buying up manuscripts a long time ago and uh, uh, collecting them. And they've got some, some of the rare ones which is really pretty neat, but now the price has gone way up. So now everybody wants to find them. Uh, Julius Caesar, 251, Thucydides, 96, Herodotus, 109. Now look at this, look at this, and look at the New Testament. Do you, do you see it? It's been preserved very well, okay? And, and some of our oldest manuscripts, really, really pretty neat, because this, the manuscripts push the writing of the New Testament into the first century. Because a lot of people think, or, or some skeptics say, ah, oh, the New Testament you know, is written much later. But now we've got manuscripts that predate uh, the Council of Nicaea. We've got manuscripts in the, in the third century, in the second century. Uh, and we have uh, about 80 of them that, that are that way. So we've got a lot of manuscripts. But, but uh, I like what Sir Frederick Kenyon says, former director of the British Museum. Um, he says this, it cannot be too strongly asserted that in substance the text of the Bible is certain, especially as the case with the New Testament. Okay, People who do this for a living, when they look at the, they look at the manuscripts, do we have an accurate copy of the New Testament? And I think, uh, I think you can come away saying, yes, we do. In uh, 2013, right here in the Dallas area, it's actually at Prestonwood Baptist Church, I, I got invited to a manuscript reveal or a manuscript discovery and it was hosted by Josh McDowell Ministries. It was fascinating. It was really neat. And so there were these scholars from all over the world. And so and then the remember you tell about the guy that, that his son and everything. He was he's the one that got me in. He says, look, i you're you're going to this. It's gonna be cool. So it was all these scholars, all these donors and me. <laughs> I mean and I you talk about feeling like a 
a tennis shoe with a bunch of tuxedos. I'm telling you, it was really, really almost out of place. But then I realized, I realized this is, I, I knew some of the guys. And so I just got right there in the middle of it and started having fun. And, and we were disco actually discovered some manuscripts. And I think it's about six uh, manuscripts never before discovered had been, was discovered there. And you can go to Josh McDowell's website and he's got a neat little video, and there's a good picture at the back of my head in one of those. One of those. Uh, so, uh, but it was, it was really cool to see that the manuscripts, and he's trying to teach people, and one of the neat guys I got to be around was a guy named Peter Flint, Dr. Peter Flint. And I met him, he was a real little guy. And he's from South Africa, and, and he, he, has, you know, he has some physical problems and everything. And so he was telling me, he got his, I said, so what's your educational background? He goes, well, I got my PhD, and uh, ancient literature, you know, studying the real, the real documents from Notre Dame. And there's was, there was four or five of us listening to him. He's just a fascinating guy, that, that beautiful South, South African accent. And he said, yeah, uh, they, they recruited me to play football there. And he's about this tall, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so I started laughing, you know, and all the other guys, wow. <laughs> and he goes, well, I, not really, <laughs> you know. It, it was really cool, but he's, he was... Come to find out, he's one of the Dead Sea Scroll editors. There are only about 30 of them in existence. I mean, these guys, just very few people who can actually touch the Dead Sea Scrolls and examine them. And, uh, and uh, he, was my, he was my buddy for the, for the two days. It was really cool. And that was that weekend in December. Uh, you may remember when it just iced and snowed. It was over. And so, you know, we were just stuck there. But what a place to be stuck. And it was cool to do, to learn more about the manuscripts. Look, I believe the Bible because I've seen some of this stuff. Uh, not just that, but, but, but because the evidence overwhelms me. And I'm not even scratching the surface today. And I'm just giving you information. For me, that's, that's the hard part, is to just give information. And uh, uh, because it's, it's never fun just to hear a bunch of information, you know. And uh, so here are two questions. Do we have an accurate copy of the original New Testament documents? Do the original New Testament documents tell the truth? And I think we can come to a conclusion that we have pretty accurate copies of the original. Okay? All right. In the background is Papyrus uh, uh, P50, P45. Excuse me. This is part of the Chester Beatty lab, Library, uh, which is in Dublin, Ireland. And it dates uh, in the uh, early 3rd century. So this is way before the Council of Nicaea. And so here we have something which has a lot of Luke in it, okay? Uh, earlier manuscripts. Here's how, how do we know we have an accurate copy of the New Testament. We have earlier manuscripts. Uh, the P52 dates maybe within 25 years of the original writing. Unheard of in manuscripts. Uh, we have more manuscripts. We have more accurately copied manu manuscripts. It's, it's estimated... Uh, by Bruce Metzger, it's about 99.9%. And there are just a few words that they're really looking for. And sometimes, some of the things they're looking for is how a word was spelled. Now, so look, if I were to take Mere Christianity, written by C.S. Lewis, and I was to take my American copy, and I was to compare it to a British copy, okay, it's written, in, it's written in, in, in England. So if I take the two copies and I compare them, would I find differences? Yeah, can, can anybody think of one? What about the word color? How would it be spelled? O-U-R? What about the word theater? You know, R-E? You, know, you, you get the thing, you get it? It would, would be differences, but would it really be differences? No, I mean, I'm still, if I read one in Great Britain, I read one here, the, the text is going to be the same. And some of the things that, that people talk about with the discrepancies in the manuscripts are, are spelling errors and things like that are differences depending on where the scribes are uh, copying. So we have, we have a lot of greatly accurate manuscripts. Comparing them together. More abundantly supported manuscripts. Now here's the cool thing. People want to say the New Testament was changed. And I want to ask the question, when was it changed? Because immediately, the documents, when, when, when the scriptures are written, the documents are sent out. And then they go all over the world. They're copied and sent all over the world. And how do we know that? Because we're finding manuscripts all over the world, all over Europe, all over, all over Asia Minor, all over Africa, all over Egypt. We're finding them. They're being spread out. And when we find them and bring them back all together from different time periods, 
they're saying pretty much the same thing. And I, when I say pretty much, I'm talking about it, you know, over 99%, it's the same thing. So then here's the cool thing. The, these documents get translated very early. Because here you got a Greek, Greek New Testament, a Greek document, and you're Roman, you want it in Latin. So it's translated in Latin. You're in, you're in Asia Minor, you want it translated into Syriac. You're in, uh, you're in Egypt, you want it translated into Coptic. And so they, they tr the translations, we can go look at the translations, and the translations are going to tell us the same thing. So if you're going to change the entire legacy of the documents, when are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? I mean, think about it. And it would be easy if you have all these different denominations everywhere. It would be easy to make your denomination right. Because after the Council of Nicaea, we have, we have, we have uh, Catholic Church, we have Eastern Orthodox Churches, we have others, we have independent churches all over Asia and Europe. Now, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus settled some of those disputes between the, between the, the, the denominations? You know, who's right? Who's right? And if you had a Jesus saying it somewhere along the way, you know, with some, some doctrine of, of how you do uh, the Lord's Supper or how you do baptism or some of the things that people... I mean, look at the things that, that denominations are different, but yet we, we still have the same Bible. Because we're, we're, miss, we're missing something along the way. I mean, we can't all be right. But, but what is the thing we agree on? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. The main thing. All right? Diocletian. Diocletian is an important figure because Diocletian led the persecution. The great, one of the greatest persecutions, probably the greatest persecution. His goal was to wipe out the Scriptures. Wipe out any documents that had anything to do with the Bible. His, that was his goal. He wanted to wipe it out, wanted to wipe out Christianity. How do you wipe out Christianity? Wipe out the books. Wipe out the documents. You remember what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4? when he says, bring, bring the books. He's about to die, and he says, bring the books with you. And he says, get Mark and bring him with you. Bring, bring me a coat, but bring the books. Uh, it's important to keep the books. Diocletian, going to kill people, going to persecute things. Now, I would love to think if I, ha I had a document, if I had some scripture, that I would be faithful to it. And I think, you know, they're going to they're gonna torture you. Would I be able to stand the pain? Maybe. I don't know. But what would be hard, what if they tortured your family? Do you see? The, the, the torture. That's why J.P. Moreland would tell us, shame on you when you don't know this. Shame on you. Telling us. Talk, talk to us that we're studying. And uh, so his persecution. Now, he wiped out a lot of Scripture. So for us to find Scripture before the Diocletian, like some of them I showed you. As a matter of fact, everyone I put up on the board were before Diocletian. Those, those are not only rare, it's, it's miraculous that they survived. I mean, just something survived that long. Now, here's a thought. How do we store data now? How do most of us store our data now? Yeah. You got it? You see, electronically, we got it. Uh, how many of y'all remember floppy disk? Anybody got any left? I do. Can you, you have anything that'll read it? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I have anything in my house. I've got... I wonder, my wife said, what are we keeping these for? I don't know, but they're labeled real nice. <laughs> you know, some test I gave in 1982, you know, something like that. And I've, I've still, you know, here it is. I've got, got these things, things done. Now, now think about it. Look at the manuscripts. They're on papyrus. Vellum. You know, sheepskins and other things. Here we got those, those manuscripts. They survived this long and we're still reading them. We still have the technology to do that. Think about it. It's really cool. I mean, did Jesus, I heard someone pray it today. Jesus came in the fullness of time. Just at the right time. By the way, another little fact. When Jesus came, because people say, what about all the people before Jesus? Did? That We know this. The World Population Census Bureau tells us that over 98% of the world's population has lived since Jesus. Pretty cool to think. Did He come in the fullness of time? Dad yeah, came in the fullness. All right, so here's Dan Wallace's, and I think I put that on there, but uh, again, the, the incredible manuscript, man. Then we come to eyewitness testimony, and I've given you the dates, and I'm not going to go over those dates because I'm scared I'm going to run out of time. Uh, 
So, uh, but some of the dates I want you to get, like the death of the James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, Peter martyred in the mid '60s. James, uh, uh, Paul dies in the mid '60s. Paul is executed in Rome. It could be early '64, late '65. Uh, some people give it as late as '67. But if you just remember the mid '60s. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb. Okay, talking about when the New Testament was written. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say Paul probably wrote all of his letters before he died. Okay? <laughs> Anybody willing to agree with me that? Okay, now, what do skeptics do? Well, they want to say, well, maybe Paul didn't write it. Now, now how's all Paul's letters start? Anybody know? First thing, for, usually the first word is what? Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He defends his apostolic authority. Why does he defend it? Because he was a Christian killer. This is a Christian killer who's become now, hey, y'all become Christians. Can you imagine Barnabas? You remember on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 7 when Paul becomes a Christian. Can you imagine he's going to Damascus to kill Christians? And then on the road to Damascus, he sees Jesus. sees the resurrected Jesus. He tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, he saw it. Then he's blinded. Then he goes to Damascus. They're all expecting him. They're scared to death. Paul, well, I'm one of y'all now. <laughs> oh, yeah, where are the rest of the guys? Yeah, would you trust him? I'd be hard to do. So what's Paul do? He's an apostle like no others. Why? He's called to be an apostle specially. And he defends it every time. So, but I go out on a, 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 a ledge to say, I think he wrote it before he died. James, James is martyred in 62. I would think the book of James is probably written before 62. <laughs> you know, it's really cool. Now, would, would you think the death of James, the death of Paul, the death of Peter, the destruction of the temple, or the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, and the temple in Jerusalem, do you think these would be important events to put in a history book? If you were writing a history of, of this time period about Christianity. Yeah, that's the book of Acts. Guess what's missing in the book of Acts? All those dates. All, not dates, but all those events. All those events are missing. You know why? Because Acts ends abruptly with Paul in Rome getting ready to go to trial when he gets under house arrest and he begins writing some of those prison epistles, which is probably AD 62 or early, earlier. We know it's probably... Uh, Prior to AD 62, because if James, the brother of Jesus, is martyred in Jerusalem, and uh, Luke is writing a history of what happens with the church starting in Jerusalem and going out, and uh, that Luke uh, would have written about the death of James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the church of Jerusalem. Now, it, it, if one of them's left out, okay, that's, that's something. But they're all left out. I mean, it ends abruptly, the way the, way the book of Acts ends. All right? And then Jesus is crucified and ascends to heaven, uh, AD 30. So we have early testimony. I want you to see this. So Paul, Paul dies in the mid 60s. James, Peter is also, I didn't put him on there. But we have 1 Corinthians. We know Acts is written 62 or earlier. Luke is written before that. We know because the first verse in Acts tells us the, the, what, the former letter I wrote to you, O Theophilus, the first one I wrote, which is the book of Luke. And so Luke is written earlier, Mark and uh, Matthew probably before Luke. Then we got Galatians very early, 2 Corinthians, Romans, and, and the list goes on. But here's one thing I want you to get is the early creed. The Bible is full of creeds. Creeds are things you remember because you've memorized. Now in the oral tradition during this time period, you know, they didn't carry these. You know, you know I remember phone numbers from kids I grew up with. I don't know what my daughter's phone number is. Now, I really don't. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't tell what either one of my daughter's phone numbers. Because what I do, I push a button. But when I was a kid, I knew every cute girl's phone number. And they never answered when I called. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, when I'd ask girls for a date, I always got this. You got a good personality. <laughs> you know, no, I just want a date, you know. All right. So, uh, most of all, the age of the eyewitnesses. So kind of keep this in your mind, the age of the eyewitnesses. Uh, we have precise, and this is, this is good. This is the way you need to read Scripture. We need to read Scripture this way. We look for details. 
Look for exact details. Because this gets good. Look at this. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Here's Luke, this is a great historian. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, there's a date. Okay, everybody get the date? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Got the date. He's going to go on. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip was tetrarch of Ituria, and Trachonitis, Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. Now, he's given me a lot of details here. He, he's wanting to make sure I know when this happens. And you can check these details out. Then he goes on, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the desert. Now see what he says. Now, here's what I want you to, want you to compare this to. Compare this to a myth. Compare this to a once upon a time story. How does Star Wars start? In a galaxy far, far away. Can't check it out. We can't check it out. But look at, look how, look at what Luke says. Check out my details. Now look, this is what's really funny. For a long time, skeptics looked at this guy right here, Lysanias, right here, this guy Lysanias. They looked at him and they said, whoa, 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 Luke got it wrong. Luke got it wrong, because we know Lysanias was a ruler over a place called Chalcis 50 years before this time. No way in the world he could still be living, and he would no way in the world to be a tetrarch of Abilene. No way in the world. Can't do it. Has anybody ever heard of anybody, like maybe a president, or two presidents having the same name? Have we ever had that in our history? Twice. You know, we, we just buried one of the President Bushes, and there's one still alive. I mean, we've had president, two President Bushes. Get, comes to find out there are two Lysanaeuses. Get, think about that. And, and, and uh, Bible scholars, before they ever found it, but archaeology proved that there really was a Lysanaeus and he was Tetrarch of Abilene, just like the Bible says. Does it sound like he's making up a story? Exact date is given. All eight people are known from history. All were known to live at this exact time. And here it is. It's not a once upon a time myth. Okay, it's not a myth. Look at this. In Acts, look at all these confirmed things. 84 historically confirmed eyewitness details. Luke includes several others in his gospel. John, 59 historically confirmed details. All right? And I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, they're, they're cowards, but I want to show you this. Okay? Actually, I'm going to go to this last thing because I'm just about out of time. Uh, let me do this. Did the writers know their stuff? I want you to see this. Fairly new research. Notice this. The very last part of your, your paper talks about statistics of names on those last two pages. Very new, very recent re research. Notice what happens with the numbers in parentheses. The numbers in parentheses are uh, the frequency of their name in, in this time period, during Jesus' time period. Okay? So Simon, he says the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, there's Simon. He's the first, that's the most common name at this time period. Who is called Peter. So notice that this is called disambiguation. It's like when you teach class, like last year I had three Hannahs. So anytime I, I wanted to talk about a Hannah, I had to know which one. I'd use the last name. That's called disambiguation. Notice this, Simon, who is called Peter. And Andrew, his brother. Andrew's 99, no, no real big, but, he's, but he is his brother. So just go ahead and say it. James, it's 11th. Pretty common name, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, John 5. Philip, 61 equal, which means it's, there's 61 names, uh, 60 names uh, bef before him that, that are, are common. So he's not very common. Bartholomew, not a very common name. So it's just Philip and Bartholomew because we know which one he's talking about. Notice this, Thomas, greater than 99, and Matthew, number 9, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. 11, James, so we have another James. And Thaddeus, 39 equal. And then Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now notice this. Matthew is doing this naturally. He doesn't know the common names. I mean, he knows they're common, but he doesn't know what's number one. He's never done a statistical survey. Why does he do this? Because he knows there are many people named this. He's an eyewitness to the details. Fascinating research. And... Uh, Thank you for listening, and I wanted to show you the books, some of the books.
Uh, this is what we use in school. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That's the only one I didn't put on the, the list. Jesus and the eyewitnesses, which is a lot of the, uh, the things that are coming up that I just showed you, that I, that I just showed you, and I wish I had time to finish all that up. Uh, but the disambiguation is really, really cool. Uh, 2006 is when this book came out. The first time the lecture was ever given about the names was given right here at Legacy Christian Academy. It was on a Sunday night. Dr. Peter Williams came. First time he was ever coming. And I'd met him the previous summer. And I asked him, I said, uh, do you believe in free speech? He said, yes. I said, good, come give one. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so he came and, uh, he, gave, and, and he, he could only be here on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock. From 6 to 8. He could be here at Sunday night at 6 to 8. And I said, oh no. Cowboys were playing in November. We had over 300 people show up. It was really cool. And he, he did this, and I was just shocked at, at, at seeing, just looking at things, looking at details. Search the text. Read the text. The text tells us a lot. Thank you all for coming. This is Peter.